Um, some of you might be familiar with this work because this is something that Keith and I have been working on, oh gosh, for the last how many years? <laughs> Seems quite long. Yeah, and all has been quite an important part in, in our work and as working with the community in, in what we're doing. So we're delighted to be back here and kind of share with you what we've been up to in the last year. So. Oh, Danny said, yeah, so nobody could hear me, could you? Darn. Um, can you see me, though? That's the thing. Um, I was going to sit down, but that really wasn't going to work. But I was quite taken with Jesse doing that this, this morning. So really, just to give you some context to what we've been doing, um, we published a book earlier this year, which has been the culmination of a lot of thought over the last sort of six or seven, probably eight years. Um, and it's actually, it's been really interesting. It was a really interesting process in itself, as writing a book always is. But actually, as we all know, we're living in very interesting times. And as we were writing the book, a lot of things changed when we started this work. Um, it was a time before Trump. It was a time, there was a time before Brexit. Um, so it's been quite interesting <laughs> writing this and trying to keep something up to date. But really, we've been looking about um, what is a digital university? What does that mean? Not in terms of finding an answer, but actually finding ways to have some of the discussions and the things that, that Jesse was talking about this morning, some of the critical discussions around what that actually means for staff and students and for our wider society. Um, and we really um, were trying to, originally we didn't set a, about doing that, but the more we were doing this, we're really starting to try and find ways to challenge some of the neoliberalism that is all around us, the context that we're all living in. Um, and it was very much a discursive, a reflective process. Um, and as we were doing that, um, it became very obvious to us that critical pedagogy was the theory that was most resonated most with the work that we were doing. And that really became our critical frame of reference. We we're also quite, all quite passionate about open education. Um, so these were the kind of things that we wanted to bring into, um, I suppose, our narrative and our, our discussions. So in terms of critical pedagogy, Obviously, you know, we have critical uh, uh, pedagogy of the, of the oppressed, but we actually look to some earlier work by Ferreira um, about um, education for criticality. I'm sorry, I'm going to forget the name of the book here. Isn't that just typical when you're being live streamed? Um, but education for critical consciousness. And some of the things that he was talking about there, about the transformation of Brazil at that time from an agrarian to an industrial society, really resonated with what we were seeing happening just now in terms of what was happening in our digital society, about the digital giants that were coming in, and in many ways, I think, oppressing us in our institutions and our, our wider uh, society. Um, so we were very much looking at that and looking at what praxis really meant and kind of unpacking our own understanding of that. And as, as we were doing that, our, our own praxis as well. But really we were looking at, and I'm going to read this, what do we mean when we were talking about praxis as a collective understanding that's derived from cycles of dialogue and exp experiential learning and a commitment to challenging and changing that which needs to be challenged and changed? I'm going to hand over to Keith at this point. As we were exploring um, and researching literature around um, uh, digital education practice and the notion of change within the curriculum, within learning and teaching, within the university, um, we came across this word transformation an awful lot. And you find that that kind of, um, proliferates across the literature on digital education practice and change. Um, and we explored some of the literature surrounding um, some of the institutional object uh, um, initiatives um, around sort of large scale change, if you like, but we also looked at what had happened with some of the major um, institutional and digital education initiatives of the last sort of 20 years. Um, Sheila and I have been involved in some of these. Um, we looked at some of the work of the, the Pew Foundation in the States sort of 15 years ago or so. Um, and one of the questions this raised to us, when we talk about the use of digital within learning and teaching, and within education, um, the question that, that comes back when you look at this literature is transformation of what and for whom? And as we looked closer, we could see lots of really good examples within institutions, within cross-institutional projects, um, where there have been real, real kind of um, enhancement to learning and teaching, to the curriculum, uh, the emergence of, of kind of, uh, um, they're not new, but the emergence in digital contexts of, of um, participative pedagogic approaches, collaborative pedagogies, and so forth. 
However, one of the things that struck us was that when we talk about this notion of transformation in relation to learning and teaching and, and significant change on more than you know, a, a, a kind of isolated or local level of practice, what we tend to see with some of the projects that have been undertaken in recent years is often there's a very strong legacy. There's models, there's case studies, there's rubrics, there's things that can support ongoing change should we choose to use them. Um, uh, but really, most of what, what tends to happen is that um, there might be some continuing enhancement, but there's no broadening out of change across a whole institution or across a, a number of collaborative institutions or across the sector. And going back to Freire and this notion of um, educational praxis, challenge and changing that which needs challenged and changed, um, one of the things that um, we were most interested in as we developed this work was the role of digital spaces and practices in extending higher education as a public good, democratising higher education um, and allowing wider society to benefit from higher education, regardless of whether individuals were aspiring to be in higher education. So really we were talking about the outputs of the curriculum, the work our students undertake, uh, other aspects of what the digital helps the universities do. And ultimately a big theme that came out of um, our work in terms of looking at this against, against I guess, the neoliberal dominantly neoliberal perspective, was a focus on people in the pedagogy, not just the technology and the managerialism. So many of you will have probably seen this at all presentations before. Um, when Bill and I orig originally started doing the work, we came up with this matrix as a way to help us kind of understand the main things that were happening in the university in terms of kind of digital things. So we, we chose these four quadrants. I won't go through them in too much um, detail. But things that we felt that, um, you know, that most people in the institution could uh, relate to. So we have curriculum and course de design. We have the learning environment, the physical and the digital. Uh, digital participation, at that point, there was quite a lot happening in the Scottish Government around about that. Um, so again, and then looking at the civic role and responsibilities of, of universities, where they're situated and how they participate within local and global communities. We very much saw information literacy um, as a high level um, concept as well. And we see, we're seeing dig uh, digital literacy as kind of a subset of that as well. So that's where we started. And we got quite a lot of, I think we got good traction. Um, we went to, did the usual things. We wrote some papers, went to some conferences, wrote some blog posts. That's where we connected with Keith. And, and this grew, but as we were doing, as I said, we realized there was much more to unpack. So over the last um, sort of year and a half, as we've been writing the book, this is what um, our model uh, looks like now. So we've added a layer of academic development and open educational practice. Um, and we've tried to make this much more of a, a three-dimensional tool, if you like. And we see this almost, um, if you like, as a as just a starting point for uh, discussions that, that people could um, use to start questioning their own context within an institution and actually the wider political context that we all live in. Jesse mentioned you know, many things about the kinds of technologies that we buy in institutions and who makes the, the decisions. But also, there's, there's, it, that doesn't happen just within the institution. There's a wider political environment that we're uh, living in. There is a neoliberal ag agenda around about education and what people think education should be as a business, as a service, that is driving some of these things as well. So we need to be able to start questioning that um, and, and have that wider discussion with people so that we can start developing, I suppose, tools and, and frameworks and ways of working that are, are meaningful to us and our students. Um, and one of the things that we've um, come up with really uh, in terms of academic development and roles of, of learning uh, technologists as well, that we see academic developers and learning technologists as a central part of any kind of digital transformation. And actually, again, to echo the, a lot that was said this morning, um, we would see academic development itself as actually needs to be mar much more critical in terms of what it's doing. And, it can be very central to any kind of um, transformation. There's a lot of porosity between roles just now. Many people are, you know, if you're an educational developer, if you're an academic, if you're a learning technologist, there's a lot of crossover in everything that we do, particularly around the use of digital technologies. And that's with our students as well. And I think there's a huge opportunity to, to work 
more closely together, but also to work um, in terms of giving some more bottom-up approaches to some of the strategic decisions that need to be taken within, um, within our institutions. And I think in terms of that criticality, we also need to be challenging some of the structures that we perpetuate as well. Um, and looking at CPD that's provided, looking at the metrics that we're providing back to people as well. And we actually need to be modeling um, that kind of critical pedagogy, notions of, of, of dialogue, of, of discursive dialogue, and actually getting people to realize that if you want to have transformation, it's not just about buying a system that will so solve everything, because it won't. It's as, as Jesse was saying, it's about investing in people. It's about having conversations with everybody and with our wider communities as well. So um, in the work, we, we explore the ways in which we might recenter, refocus the digital in relation to our institutions, our pedagogic practices, the notion of higher education um, as a public good. And one of the things that we, we kind of honed in on towards the end of our, our work um, was looking at the curriculum as an open and negotiated space um, and, and trying to move beyond um, conceptions of the curriculum as um, uh, the kind of syllabus that we engage our students in, um, or the process of development, because hopefully it is also a process of personal development. Um, but we were really interested in the curriculum as something that we're all engaged in within higher education, to some extent or another, um, as a, a co-located space and place, and what that might mean in relation to how we harness the digital. And in probably quite a modest way, we were seeking to try and extend, if we could, notions of the curriculum um, uh, to a wider context that related to higher education being extended as a public good, um, and which also dealt with, um, uh, or perhaps sought to reframe aspects of things like open education practice as well. So we won't go through this in, a lot, in, in detail, there isn't time, and, and we're, we're conscious to try and finish on 12, um, but we've put forward um, a model of the digitally distributed curriculum, if you like, um, which we've tried to make evidence-based. We've, we've looked at um, uh, drawn on our own work and looked at things in the sector um, to try and arrive at this model and conceptualize the curriculum uh, as a, a kind of negotiated and co-located space and place. Um, the way in which we've conceptualized this is around values, enabling dimensions, and what we call instantiation and enactment, the, the practical ways of getting this done. Um, so at the heart of the model, we're talking about praxis, participation, and public pedagogy. Praxis in terms of challenging and changing, that which needs challenge and change public pedagogy in relation to not just how we engage externally, but how our pedagogies are negotiated with those in our wider communities. And participation, participation in the activities of the curriculum, not just for our students and, and, and our, our kind of uh, lecturers or academics, but participation in the activities of the curriculum for those beyond the institution. Um, one of the things that we were kind of, um, uh, we think was, thought was really important to this um, in terms of our enabling dimensions, was co-location, co-production, porosity, which Sheila's mentioned, and also open scholarship. And we go into these in, in a lot of detail within, within the work itself. One of the things I'll just draw attention to very quickly is around porosity and co-location. And we felt across both these dimensions, it was really important to try and move away from quite a dominant, dominant rhetoric, really, around um, open in which we conflate open with the open online and open digital. And we were seeking to look at how the open online um, might coexist and intersect with the open on campus uh, and the open in the community. And for us, there were lots of implications there around self-selected digital learning spaces, the intersection between formal and informal learning, learning communities, and also our digitally rich spaces in the community, not just our campus spaces, but our libraries, our public spaces that can be used to provide opportunities to, to um, widen access to, to education, um, formally and informally, um, and to enact a more negotiated curriculum. Now, we're conscious that we focus this on the digitally distributed curriculum. Um, we explain in the work that actually this could easily have been um, framed as, a digitally, as digitally distributed higher education or digitally distributed learning and teaching. But there are particular reasons why we sought to focus on the curriculum. Um, and we're looking to, as we take our work forward, um, apply this in various contexts and further develop these ideas. Um, and for anyone that happened to be at the session that, that Scott Connor and I did, um, don't think we've got five minutes if we want people to get on, but we'll, we'll finish just now. Yeah. Um, uh, in relation, if anyone came to the session that Scott Connor and I did uh, yesterday, um, we are taking this as a key point to frame 
the development of a, a new open education framework, a UHI. Um, we are a digitally distributed university across a wide geographic region, so the intersection of the open online, open on campus and open in the community is something we want to use this to try and take forward. Um, Sheila, have you got any concluding points? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that was, that, I think that was us. I think obviously we're just running through this very, very quickly. There's an awful lot that we've tried to pack in here, but I think uh, we just want to say that actually the support and the interest that we've got from the Oak community has been really valuable to us as we've done our work, as we've uh, written the book as well. So we really appreciate the opportunity to come back and speak to you. Also, there's lots that we have done. There's lots that we haven't done. There are many areas that we just didn't have the time or the space to put into the book. So we'd be really interested in, in speaking to you more about this and having a longer discussion with you. If, if, you, if you would like, just come and see us, find us um, over the next day and a half. And we'd love to discuss this and talk about what we've done in our work and more about our, our thoughts and our philosophy behind it. So please do, do find us later. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with multiple, our Jupyter Notebook servers. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.